Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. We are live here in Aravaca, Arizona, and uh, joined by a master and a guy who's still learning every day on bass, Glenn Moore. Welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Oh, thanks, Jake. I, you know, in our first interview, you were talking about um, having an opportunity to play with, with Jeremy Steig. Occasionally, Jan Hammer would play drums with you, but you guys did a lot of duo concerts, to <clears throat> you and Jeremy. Yes. And I just want you to talk to people out there about how to keep time with a flute player and there's no trap set. I mean, how do you, how did you learn to become comfortable in that in that duo setting? It's not a traditional duo setting. Well, <clears throat> my, my when I first really started playing, when I got to college, I started really playing with a uh, with a great piano player and uh, some good drummers, and we played mostly uh, Oscar Peterson's repertoire. So this piano player, a fellow named Peter Mortensen, a really wonderful piano player, um, loved Oscar and could play most, almost anything that Oscar could play, and he expected me to be Ray Brown. So, <laughs> so those are some shoes to fill. So that that involves learning how to play time. If you listen to Ray Brown, um, you find out right away just what uh, what good time is. <laughs> and so I had several years of playing mostly piano trio, um, traditional stuff. It, in 1959, when I met Peter, um, there were a great number of wonderful jazz piano players, uh, trio players, particularly the jazz piano was a, a real renaissance stage. And it's before stereo, so it meant that anyone who played the piano um, had a completely distinctive sound. There was no homogenizing it, which was the effect of stereo was to... In the mono setting, it was it was completely unique. I mean, everybody had their own sound. Right? Yeah, yeah, everyone everyone sounded different. And in those days, my, my uh, the people I was listening to music with really believed that if you knew a player, you should be able to recognize us playing in, a, in eight bars or so, just from the touch. I mean, Earl Garner actually had music on the radio then. In fact, I loved him. <laughs> there were a lot of great piano players in the, in the jazz scene, certainly, and the bass player was definitely expected to play with great time, and I didn't start out playing with great time. It took quite a while. It took some being able to work several gigs where I worked six nights a week for four or five months at a time, and with the bass, learning how to learning how to play the bass with a strong time feel uh, really involves playing night after night after night after night. Does it? And 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 these were settings with with uh, with no trap set. It yeah, was, most often. Guitar, piano, bass. No, just oftentimes just piano, bass. So duo. Right. Just, that that was the strongest thing that uh, that I ended up doing because in little bars they didn't they didn't want to hear drums anyway, and <laughs> so it was usually bass and piano. And then I played in a I played in a big band uh, all through college. Every Wednesday night, played uh, at the Union Hall in Eugene, Oregon, and when I started. That gig, I had my plywood bass, which was a Chubby Jackson five-string, which I finally took the... Chubby, man, that's a blast. I took the uh, fifth string off because I couldn't play four, let alone five. And I played my little plywood bass. And it didn't sound nearly as good as this one does, but... When I started playing with that band, there were no there were no amplification for the bass, and the whole first year, 
I couldn't hear myself at all when I was playing with the big band because I wasn't playing that strong or that in tune. And so the bass in those days, and lots of times in a big band, setting the bass is kind of a... It's a... <laughs> it's just a thump. And I couldn't play the thing well enough and in tune enough that you could even, that I was even in tune. <laughs> How fitting. I, well, well uh, let me ask you, um, like for people out there that are in the exact space that you were in at that time where you couldn't hear yourself, how did you work your way out of that? I just kept playing and practicing. Sorry, there's some people here looking at the air conditioning. Um, it took me the four years that I was in school to get to, to become a strong enough player that once in a while you could actually hear the pitch I was playing. Because otherwise, it takes a tremendous amount of callus on the fingers to play acoustically and, um, and a strong enough hand to, to be able to uh, hold a string down long enough that, you could, that anyone could hear it. Um, when did you, when did you, I, I was, I have, I've had, I've caught a couple of great uh, hangs with Steve Swallow recently. And, um, I wanted you to talk about truly the cats, Scotty LaFaro, Red Mitchell, Swallow, those guys in the early sixties, when you realized that, or, or when they, when you realized that they were actually using the upright bass as a lead instrument, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a voice. Voice, yeah. And can you talk about the, the impact that it had on you? Well, hearing, first of all, hearing Scott LaFerro with Bill Evans, uh, I was listening to all the piano trio music, and when, when uh, Portrait in Jazz, the, the first of the, those trio albums came out, this was a guy with a sound just like an angel, and um, he he does a little bit of walking on that record, but he he ended up, Scotty played with many people, and I finally got to play the bass uh, it, last year at Ithaca that uh, Scotty's bass, the one that was in the accident with him, was finally restored. It's fabulous. Oh, you mean in the car accident? Yeah, yeah, where he died. Um, hmm. But he could, that was a gorgeous instrument, he could play it beautifully, and he ended up being able to, he was a clarinet player, I think it was his first instrument, and uh, so he played a lot of counterpoint with Bill. And Bill, as it turned out, was playing, it sounds as if he's floating free, and yet he played, he played pretty, uh, he was very consistent in his playing and would, would play so that LaFaro could play counter melodies. Right, him, right, right, right. And could play, could work out things uh, so that you can hear toward the last album there where there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interplay and there's a lot of back and forth and there's a lot of the bass in the higher register and um, it was, I mean, it was a little bit of a, more than a little bit of a revolution. Why? Uh, because the bass was supposed to, was in a Ray Brown song. That's what I was going to go back to Ray Brown, which was just locking it in. He would lock it in, but in the, in his playing, he also, with Peterson, would play, if he was playing anything that wasn't just completely up-tempo from the beginning, well, he would play in two for a while before he went into four four time. And so it was a very strong playing on one and three that you had to learn to be able to do, uh, you know, before you went into four four time. And in those days, if you were playing for dances, which a lot of the work was dance work, so people are doing. Uh, sort of a two-step. That's right. And if you play in four-four time, they can't. The audience could not feel the time, so you had to play in two. 
And I played in bands. I played in a band with a couple of guys who were really Dixie Island players. And if I played in 4-4 time, they thought it was a bass solo. <laughs> they would stop playing and, you know, like hold their instruments quietly and let me play by myself because for the Dixieland players, if you're playing at 4-4 time, that was a bass solo. That's amazing. So there was, I've lived through this transition from, there are, there are online some Ray Brown bass lessons where he's teaching some European kids and he talks about playing, playing, playing all the, the kinds of slap bass and uh, all the schools of, of playing the bass that come from late 20s and the 30s. Um, so you really had to, just to get as far as Ray got to finally being able to play the, the instrument very demonstratively and just a great feel, boy oh boy. Um, so it, was, it had to be very strong and LaFaro when I first heard him uh, on the record with, uh, with Victor Feldman. Right, the that's, arrival the arrival of Victor Feldman. Yeah, the arrival of Victor Feldman. That's some, and Stan Levy, that's some very strong, right in the pocket, 4-4 four, four playing and you hear what a strong player. And that was, I think LaFerro had been playing two or three years when he made that record. And there's a Stan Getz record as well with he and uh, I think Cal Jader. It's down there in the collection. Yeah, so um, LaFerro actually played more with Ornette than he did with Bill Evans. And as it turned out, every situation that he played in, he played completely differently. He played to the situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the whole uh, time feeling business, or independent time feeling, in order to get back to your question here, of playing with Jeremy. Jeremy grew up with Eddie Gomez. And I only got to work with Jeremy because so much because Eddie was on the road all the time. And I ended up uh, luckily, fortunately, being able to take his place on a good number of those gigs. And uh, Eddie would get a call and he would send it to me. Um, so Jeremy grew up with an extremely strong uh, bass player at his side. And so Jeremy's time was fabulous. And uh, so he, he was easy to play with. It was easy to play with good time with, with Jeremy. So such an honor. People are loving to see Glenn Moore here. It's such an honor to, to be on the program. But but uh, the 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 question is like we go back to the story, Maruga Booker, who's tuning in. Uh, you had there was a call out to the underground New York scene when you guys were uh, trying to find a drummer. Maybe not for Oregon, but it might have been for the consort. But the, for, no, for Tim. For, for Tim. Tim Harden again. But the, but but the question is this: as it evolved into Oregon, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Um, it became apparent that uh, within the construct of the, the quartet that the tablas were a better percussive fit for the band. It, it gave more space to the to the musicians. Is that was there a con well, I mean, because you 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 went through some drummers. Well, That's obviously hardened, but but I mean, I'm just there. Why was there no trap drummer? Exception of Elvin, obviously, with that one album. But what? Why did the tablas fit well within the, that quartet? Well, Ralph and I started playing in these same years, shortly after I met Peter Mortensen, actually at the same time I met Ralph. And we started listening to Bill Evans and we started playing all those tunes. And, you know, sort of our version of them. And that was mostly in a duo circumstance. We didn't have any, we rarely had a drummer that could play that, that Paul Motion style. Yeah, right. So, so we started with that repertoire and then added the guitar when after Ralph spent a year in, in Vienna studying the guitar, Brazilian music was just hitting, uh, becoming popular. And so we started playing that with the repertoire of, of the day, really all the things that uh, 
that Joe Bean had written and things that were popular. So we started playing that music. So playing with the bass and the guitar was quite a bit different than playing the bass with the piano and or piano and drums. It was a piano's, you know, 200 times as loud as the guitar, just even if it's a bad piano. So with the guitar, uh, pitch is, is so important. You're not playing with a different school of instrument, but the guitar is another string instrument. And so I began, as soon as I heard Ralph playing the guitar, uh, I had to learn as much as I could to use or my fingers to use my thumb to be able to play to play the soft end of the spectrum, something which for the most part jazz bass players never get to do. They sit down next to a, a drummer and the old uh, right circumstance for playing with a, with a drummer was that the hi-hat is right here. Right. And, and you put the bridge as close as you can to it and to, you get as close as you can to the drummer and try and uh, try and play with him and uh, try and get so he, close enough to him that he can hear you <laughs> if he needs to. And uh, so when we played with the Winter Consort, the Winter Consort did not use trap drums. There was, uh, with, with Tim at that time, uh, Booker played at, at Woodstock with Tim. Um, was he playing just r random percuss percussion, or was, was you know it... he didn't even show up for the for the gig that Colin ended up uh, uh, getting. But the Woodstock footage that you can't hear you guys, but you can hear no. Tim was Maruga on traps, or was, was there a trap set on that gig? Or uh, it, yeah, he was doing something with the traps. I don't know. <laughs> but it, you know, it wasn't. I did. <laughs> that was a pretty bad performance. The next night was much better, but that's not on. That's not captured. That's not history. It's, yeah, it's up in, it's in the cosmos. But so, so 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 Colin showed up, and the the polyrhythm or the counterpoint. I had met Colin earlier in 1969, and got to play with the tabla and the sitar, and that was a mind blowing, very soft experience, and. Uh, I love playing with it. It was, I could hear myself, I could hear my pitch, I could use harmonics. I didn't have to just play. I could, I could play. I mean, there were a lot more options. The, the soft end of the spectrum was much more Collins hitting the drums with his fingers. It's not, there are no sticks involved. Right, right, this is it. So, <clears throat> when Colin, Ralph, and I joined the Winter Consort, where Paul McCandless was already playing, there, Colin was playing the only drums that were played, and so there were tabla, there was various percussion. He, had, he, he was a trained, at Indiana University, orchestral percussionist. He went to IU too? Oh, yeah. Oh, so he, he was a classical percussionist, but yeah. Um, continue, yeah. Yeah, he had, he had uh, and as a percussionist, he had been drawn more to Indian music than to jazz music. So he didn't go naturally to the, I mean, he could play the snare like a, like a great. <laughs> he could play the, he could play jazz drums. Well, he, he became a jazz drummer after he really, really became uh, good friends with Jack DeJanet. Why? Ah. When Colin died, by the time he died, he had become a really, he was definitely, he could, he could deal with the time feel. Uh, that's just... He was, it was, he was beginning to be able to do that. So, but the early years with Oregon, the bass was the loudest instrument in that band. Let's just repeat that. The bass was the loudest instrument. Yeah, the bass was louder than the classical guitar. Right. Uh, it was louder than the oboe. And it was louder than the tabla or the sitar. So it was a dream situation uh, which evolved in, in Oregon's, you know, eventually from the consort and then leaving the consort and beginning to play as a quartet in and around New York. 
um, I learned to, to play, you know, Ralph's guitar pieces uh, with the oboe and the tabla. Um, so we evolved from, we started really in 1970, made our first record in the summer of 1970. And just was road, finding... Was road? Road was made in 1970. Right, David Darling on that as well? Yeah. Yep. But Oregon recorded our first record that year, just uh, two months after Road was recorded. Mm. It didn't come out right away. But um, because Colin really had a classical or a folk music sense of time and uh, his Indian training, and Paul was a uh, Paul had played saxophones and all of the blown instruments, but he was really, you know, a great classical oboe player. And Ralph and I, because our influences were more along the line of Bill Evans' music, we were we could play and play with the time, jazz time, and neither. Neither uh, Colin nor Paul could really deal with that time. And from 1970 until about 1975, it took that long for us to be, for Ralph and I to not play so far on top of the beat and for Colin and, and Paul to be able to get accustomed to this underlying triplet feeling that, that jazz music had. Uh, That's remarkable because the best records art from that time period and yet you, you you're talking well they're they're best because you can hear right into it it's transparent each thing it's authentic yeah each thing is right there and uh you know after after 1980 uh we took a year off and ralph got a synthesizer and after that the music was quite different and uh never yeah, I mean, the synth we was just... We turned to that sort of crystalline... Uh, at one point, we were carrying as many as any 80 instruments with us when we were on the road because we needed a, Ralph needed to drag along a French horn or a trumpet or a cornet. Um, I needed to have a, an accordion. There were all kinds of... You instruments. had an accordion on... You, yeah, everyone uh, had their... Was you it? were welcome to bring anything <laughs> that you would carry. And... Uh, as long as you could carry it right. in and back and forth to the truck. And uh, if you didn't use it more than once a night, then usually it, it might not make the next tour. That was sort of the, the way it evolved. So I learned to play in that circumstance. It wasn't until we played in Chicago and uh, they had bought Charles Mingus, who was pretty late in his life, they bought him a pickup for his bass. And when he was through with a week there, he took it off and threw it on the stage at the, of the Quiet Night, this great club in Chicago. So when we went there, um, the engineer said, well, you know, there's a Mingus's pickup. I guess you can use that if you want to. So I never used it. I put it on and it meant that I could start, I could really start. Begin to be able to play um, using the harmonics as, as oftentimes as a motor for a piece, the quieter things, not just be able to. It's been 103, 104 degrees. Yeah, it's here. bubbling out here. The magic of those early records with Oregon has to do with being able to explore this, the soft sounds, the soft combining of tones together of these beautifully well-placed, played 
<laughs> instruments. Um, and no one else at the time, everyone else was going to, I mean, weather reports started at the same time that we did. And it became very electric and, uh, and huge. Let me, uh, this is so, the other thing that was rev revolutionary about Oregon, correct me if I'm wrong, when you guys started to play before and after the concerts with Paul Winter, um, a lot of it was being, you'd hear the first sound. Someone would make, a, I remember Ralph telling me in our interview, someone would, you'd be playing off the first sound, somebody else would then come in, everybody was listening, but you'd play off the first sound that somebody would make. Yeah. And it was completely organic. And I mean, did that was where did that concept come from? That that's that's completely unique. I mean, well, the idea of the idea of totally saying. I mean, there was not even a song. You know, well, it was just listen to. No, the, it's a tone. It was a tone. Yeah. But I really want you people out there need to know because this is how musical vocabulary grows. Well, it's it's like are are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? And if you are, if someone plays a note. While uh, there, there are, you know, three other possibilities for the people involved. So you just, it's like Ralph tells a story. It's, it's like you step outside your door, you know, you take that first step and, <laughs> uh, and well, what's outside? You decide, you know, you're going to go for a walk or you're going to head to some place, but how do you, how do you get there? So you... And then you take another step, and you step into the light, and things get more complex. So there's a tone, and there's another tone. Will it be a complementary one, or will it be something totally different? Will it be something rhythmic? And will that be an interruption? And will there continue to be, like, long tones being played? Or, I mean, it really... I thought that a lot of the free music that we did early on sounded like compositions that Stravinsky himself could have written, where you're dealing with a number of different tonal centers at the same time. It could be this, it could be that, it could be anything. As long as it was exquisitely played and with, with uh, a dynamic that didn't just destroy something. So we were going in the exact opposite direction that everyone else was going in to make something beautiful and strong and insane, which certainly the Mahavishnu Orchestra, that's what they were doing. And that's what Weather Report was doing. And we were of that group of people. You know, I, I completely out. agree. And then it's uh, it's Weather Report, it's Mahavishnu. And, and uh, Return to Forever. Thank you. All those cats were playing plugged in heavy electric stuff. But we all played, away from those situations, we all played and hung out and played Bill Evans songs and played, you know, we were all Bill Evans. Within those, all, within that, all those different bands, you would you would connect with other kids. Well, we would just get together and play. Get together with the, uh, Michael and Randy Brecker and uh, Hal Galper. Liebman. Liebman, these people, Byrak, these oh, people. All salt like of the earth, man. This, um, <laughs> so we, Bill Evans was a touchstone for possibility. And uh, John McLaughlin would come to gigs that I was playing and he, he wouldn't, he would be invited to come. He would set up, a song would be played, an original song of some kind. And it took him, you know, about half of the song to figure out where it was and what it was. And then he'd just play with you. Would he play, and he played acoustic guitar. Oh yeah. I love it. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Unbelievable. Was, he came to town to play with Miles, and he was playing, um, well, he was playing, you know, amplified acoustic guitar, but not an electric guitar. I was around in 71 when he got, when he got his first Telecaster that way, or whatever that guitar was. Insane. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 yeah the, that, that, that thing is indescribable. Yeah. The, um, this is really important for creativity. Uh, I'm, I'm going to botch the name, but you did this thing at a certain point where you all the lights would go off at a performance, and oh, it was yeah. it's called "Lose Your Mind and, and Open Your Senses." Can Come you talk about senses. To, to explain that entire? Because that is completely multi-sensory kind of experience that is totally missing in, a, in the formula trip that we're in today, as far yeah, as yeah. 
Well, that's something that Paul did. Paul McCandless. Paul, no, Paul, Paul Winter. Paul Winter. He's tuning in right now. He had now, that yeah. in his program. And so this, I think it was about a week into that, we switched to David Darling after one week. That was a 10-week tour. And what Paul had to say about this piece, we were going, Paul said, okay, we're going to turn the lights off and we're going to, uh, <laughs> we're going to play whatever. You can play anything. He said, you know, you can think of it as a, maybe, because he'd had mostly classical musicians, think of it as a, a, there's a Dorian scale and you can play any note you want to. And so <laughs> we're like, oh boy. Okay, so... We, you know, somebody would play a note and somebody else would play something completely different. And within a week, we ended up starting to play with David Darling as well. And David had an amplified cello. And so David, once he got started singing and playing that cello, why the piece would go a certain way. So we, we ended up using that piece where the lights are turned off. Um, we would make improvisations that were completely, uh, you know, completely free and that and never, never, you know. Is there anything close that you guys recorded uh, with with the Winter Consort that co that can can uh, people can access that relates to what you're talking about? Oh well, road. Is live. There there's are live, live cuts, and, yeah. there's a, and there's a there's a food piece on there, so you can hear that. And Oregon took that and went with it. When we were first together, we would play three, four, maybe five, free pieces in a in a uh, set because we didn't have that much uh, repertoire, and uh, the free playing was something that. We started doing a lot of the free playing with Jeremy Steig, actually. Really? Before, before Oregon was, when we were just getting going, after we'd made our first record, but still pretty much not, not, uh, not ready to do the uh, music of another present era or uh, the, the ECM record, we... Uh, the Trio, solos, solos, trios, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we would, uh, I was going, Jeremy asked me one night to come to WBAI radio uh, because he would go on, there's a guy named Bob Fass who had a show that went from midnight till 6 a.m. And Jeremy would go on there and bring his friends and they would play, just improvise all night. Every once in a while, it'd be like a station identification and otherwise there's no talking <laughs> about what we were doing we would just play it was like donald mcdonald and 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 denny zeitlin and those the, the satters the, the the or just 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 friends like young no, it, was, it was jeremy and uh denny zeitlin lived in san francisco and he was never in new york that i know of and i never did any free playing with him but and donald was the drummer later on with tim but he no he didn't participate in that but First it was Jeremy and I, and then maybe it was Jeremy and Colin and I, and then Ralph came, and eventually Oregon developed quite an audience by playing on WBAI at night. And so they started doing these so-called free music stores uh, where they do live concerts in their studio, and we did one of those. And it was recorded. Oh yeah, and there was an an audience there. Oh, that, yeah. That's right, huge audience. Uh, Aaron Copeland came. Uh, real people came to <laughs> real real, yeah. real people came to the real real musicians came to hear us. And so, but, but was, Jeremy was kind of the precursor to it. That was excuse me. Jeremy was Jeremy was the precursor. Yeah, Jeremy was the and yeah, Jeremy. I spent quite a bit of time with Jeremy and. Did you did you find you talk about the soft parts of the bass? Yeah. Okay. You've you've mentioned it a couple of times, and you played so many gigs with the the straight ahead bebop cats, the straight jazzers, Zoot, Zoot Sims and and Jake Hanna. You played with Dick Burke at these you know dingy clubs, but there was no amplification. So you was how much did your ears grow because of that? Because nowadays it. 
you, I mean, everything's so plugged in now. And Everything you have, is plugged in. You know, in, in those days, I was still playing the, the uh, fourth tuning man. Yes. Um, so I played with some really loud drummers, and they would all, uh, you know, they don't all just cut out. Play like the solo. Hawaiian cat? If you... I played a, yeah, if I would play a solo. And so I found out that there were situations I played in where the only way I could hear myself was... <laughs> to whatever song was happening in unisons and that was the only way I could make enough sound to hear yourself be heard. so there was a lot of walking and then uh, to rest the fingers I would I would play with the bow and I could bow uh, melodies high on the instrument you can kind of hear them but but it took <laughs> Just be and, and be hurt. You had the feather comforter that you'd throw on the floor, yeah. and then you'd throw the bow on the floor, but you yeah. really couldn't hear. The guy was 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 bad. But I guess what I'm getting at is you used the word harmonics, and I just wanted you, you, you talk about the soft part of the bass. Yeah, you're talking. About it. technique and I guess one of the unusual things I did was go ahead and tune this to a low C because Colton's instruments were all in D and when organ was first together why we would play to those keys. Um, so I didn't have a low D and I tried. So I could tune down my E to a D, but it really... It's pretty, that doesn't really work. So I put on a low C, which Switch strings for you now, but that meant that that meant I had these. 
saw pits. So I started playing with my thumb in ways that I'd never played with my thumb before because it And so so it gave me so a real bass note was usually doubled with a another octave above it so you had a As Oregon got going, we started playing opposite Gary Burton's band quite a bit. And along came Everhard Weber. Weber. With a five-string instrument with a high C, which he bowed like a god. And I was pretty heavily influenced by his playing. We played, I don't know, maybe over the course of uh, six years or seven years, maybe a hundred nights on the same stage listening to Gary's band. Then Everhart brought a band to America and we toured with that. Ted Curlin booked it and Ted was a, an agent out of Boston that Gary Burton had got started really as a I think he guy. still represents Gary Burton. Yeah. Well, Gary's not playing anymore now, but he's retired, but... So, Eventually, I ended up with a low C and a high C. And with that tuning came some really unusual music and unusual compositions uh, that never would have happened without that changing. So, Dave Holland, Dave Friesen, all the Daves, uh, all my bass player friends, when I switched and changed my tuning, they all said, oh, Glenn, you're insane. Why would you want to do that? You spent all these years learning, you know, this tuning, and, and why would you want to change anything? And I'm like, well, because because of the music, because I, without that low D, I can't really do my job. And so eventually, you know, all those people became fans of, you know, what an unusual thing and how great and, you know, super duper. Uh, Jan Hammer finally saying when we played in 1980 at the Berlin Jazz Festival, he said, you guys are the modern jazz quartet. Oregon. Yes. You, you High know. compliment from Jan, dude. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he was, he listened. Zalvinal listened, too. I mean, everybody listened. Um, what, what, I just want you to talk to people about, um, in, in Oregon especially, again, you didn't have a traditional rhythm section, but, um... What was your concept that any, the downbeat, that any note could be the one? You got lost in a, in a jam and you all come back in on that. But it's the concept of, you know, you, hear, you see rhythm sections today, not necessarily in, in, in the kind of music that you were playing, but you see people very concerned, where's the one, where's the one, where's the one? Well, sometimes, I mean, you'll stop and there, there can be a new one. A new one. Explain <laughs> the new one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it just... Um, you know, real things happen when when Oregon did a uh, when we did our first record for Vanguard. Uh, Colin did a really smart thing. Maynard Solomon, the president of Vanguard, said, "Well, you boys, okay, now that you're here, now that you're here and you're uh, you're gonna make this record, uh, you'll need a producer." Hmm. And we're like, hmm. Paul <laughs> said, well, would you be our producer? And he was like, he was touched. He said, oh, so, uh, certainly I'd be, you know, I'd be honored. So we went in the studio and we played one of our free pieces. And we were all kind of hopped up and very excited to be doing this. So we start this piece and it's going along and then it stops. And then we started again, and because it wasn't really time to stop yet, but it had just by chance stopped. 
So we go in and we listen to this and, you know, we have like a four minute piece and there's a little, there's a stop in the middle of it. And, and Maynard, who's listened to the conversations and how we got there and just heard this amazing thing, said, oh, boys, that was wonderful. Can you go in and do that again without that stop? We said, never in a million years. <laughs> So at the end of that first session, he said, you know, I don't think you guys need a producer. Go ahead, boys. And that was Colin it. was a genius. He, he somehow knew, because he was, Maynard was the owner of the company, but he was yeah. not a, your traditional producer. No, he wasn't. Well, he he was, wasn't a Phil Ramone guy who's gonna, who said to you, I like Icarus, make nine more songs just like that. Yeah. Because that's what a traditional producer would do. Yeah. Or they'd want to bring in a trap set or something like that. Colin knew... If we just play what we what is in our hearts, then yeah. it'll just the truth will reveal itself. Yeah, yeah, things will. So there's back to the yeah. So we were we were extremely fortunate to be able to have the opportunities that we had when we made at the same time that we made. This record with Maynard, two months later, Manfred Eicher wanted us to make a record. And we had to decide then, before we'd ever re recorded, except for our first record, was, which was not out yet, we had to decide what we wanted to do, whether we wanted to go with this German label, which was like, whoa, Germany, we're in New York. You're right. So it seemed like to make a choice that was kind of hard. So we decided that we did want to be able to make records in our hometown. And so we signed with Vanguard and we agreed to make a record for ECM at the same time. So we did trios and solos. Uh, Vanguard, who paid us hardly anything, when we did that, they said, oh, well, you guys broke the contract. So they, they like made all the money half of what it had already been. I think we were getting two hundred and fifty dollars a piece for each record, and so after that they paid us a hundred and. And you were managing yourselves, right? You didn't. One hundred and twenty-five dollars have... we'll give you, and so uh, so they never gave us any money, but they let us have a studio at night, right? When nobody else wanted it, we would we could be interrupted at any point by by a paying customer. But they let us make, I guess we made a total of seven, actually eight records for them. <clears throat> and, uh, but the one that we made for ECM uh, went to Europe uh, and it was amazing. And we immediately got a tour in Europe for the next year for 1973, it came out in 72. And once we went there, Instead of playing in these little clubs where Colin sat on the floor with his drums, so we'd have to go and first of all scrub the floor of the stage in whatever little coffee house or whatever corner you played in, we'd have to clean it because wow. he he had to put down his nice rug and sit there barefooted and, and right. It was, it was so it was, we'd have to clean uh, the place, and uh. if we were staying in the apartment that went with the gig. We'd have to clean that completely so we could cook in it and not, you know, get food poisoning. So, but when we got to Europe, they, we played in small art galleries. Um, if we played in a hall, which we did a couple of radio concerts, and they had, they were like, well, which, in America, we couldn't get a piano anywhere. In Europe, they said, which piano do you want? We have this year's model. We have one with kind of a different action on it. You could have that. Here's one with a slightly higher pitch. And they'd offer you three or four pianos. So all of a sudden, we were in heaven <laughs> because there were little halls. They were just little at first, but there were halls with real pianos. And uh, the radio houses were all uh, like recording studios with the best gear and great engineers. So we ended up accepting a pay cut in America but having European tours to do. And you're and you were you're getting paid for that. You know, yes. so did did you you know it's funny, did you uh 
A lot of people don't know Glenn Moore was playing behind a lot of folk singers. <clears throat> there were that, those were gigs back in the day. I mean, obviously Tim Harden. Um, but um, the, the one of the guys on Vanguard was a guy named Fritz Richmond. Uh, he was with the Jim Queskin Jug Band, and he uh -huh. he played uh, the uh, wash tub bass. Yeah. Did you ever did you ever touch the wash tub? You know, I I touched one. <laughs> he touched the, the tub. No, you know what I want you to talk about is your experience with the electric bass. Oh well, now that was early on. There wasn't that much, even though they finally had a pickup. It wasn't that great a sound, and so I played early on. I play. I even used Jocko's bass once when my bass was being repaired. You used Jocko's bass. Yeah. Because yeah, Jocko yeah. used to come check you and, and Benny Wallace out. I mean, he used yeah. to come and, and... Oh, he'd come and play with us. Jocko picked up my bass, played it while well, I played the vibes because <laughs> somebody had a set of vibes there. And Jocko was playing up, and you were playing electric at the day? You were playing no, upright. I was playing this bass. And Jocko and picked... Jocko came and asked if he can set in, and I said, well, sure, go ahead. I'll, you know, play vibes. think around on the vibes. Yeah, right. So Jocko was like... I gotta get me one of these. <laughs> <laughs> and he played the bass a little bit in his youth, but uh, it wasn't his instrument really. But yeah, I played it because I needed something that sustained. And out there every once in a while there somebody took a little footage of me with this bass and I was so happy that I could I could turn around in circles while I played <laughs> and just keep track of the chord so I didn't trip myself. But you know, you're locked to a, you're tied to the ground when you play the acoustic. And so it could be fun once in a while to play. And I mean, there were some, Stanley Clark was playing, you know, the bejubis out of the. Uh, Miroslav, you know, Vitus, yeah. And Jocko, I played a lot with Jocko and Jocko, Larry Karish and I did a lot of playing together, just jamming and so electric, Going this way, I learned, I taught myself to play it kind of with Ralph's classical guitar technique where you sit and put it on your, and to get, you know, just be able to play it. But I had no instincts. I'm used to doing this. Totally and, different uh, yeah, muscles and, and yeah. yeah. And I would overplay it. I, I would like pull the strings off of it. <laughs> while you were in circles. Yeah, yeah, while I'm walking in circles. So, uh, yeah, so I didn't play it very much. I played as little as possible. And when it came time for the second Winter Consort album, it was announced the night I showed up with my good bass, I finally got this bass, and Paul Winter called me to his room, you know, at the end of the night to get paid or whatever, and he's like, oh, and Glenn, on the next album I want you to play only electric bass. And I said, oh, yeah, but I just got, I said, well, look, you have to find somebody else because I'm, I'm not an electric player. I won't do, I won't do a good job. My heart won't be in it. So he got her Bushler to come and play. And that was on that album Icarus. That's right. You weren't there. There's that whole picture. And I'm always wishing that you were there. Of course, my man Bushler was playing because he was an electric bass player. So you actually, you know, b before we wrap, because you have uh, some other thing, errands, to, uh, things to do on the farm here in Arvaca. Yeah. You know, you were always looking for gigs that could pay you something in order for you to play what you love, which you know, for better or for worse, it's it's been labeled jazz. The label is jazz, and you yeah. it was burning spiritual music, and so you scuff. You know, I mean, you were just doing it for a long time. There was a certain point where you could finally talk to your first wife and say, "Hey, the kids can come out now. I have a loft." Like you were starting to make some headway, and but I just want you to talk about in your mind in the late fifties, early sixties, when you were just beginning to understand what in your mind, was the jazz life. Because, you know, there are cats like Mingus who died broke. We know that the geniuses of this music, a lot of them died broke. Yeah. What was the jazz life to Glenn Moore, and what was so insatiable? What was the need to have to go and play with Brignola and Burke for five bucks a night and some spaghetti or something? What was the jazz life at that time? Because today, you go to the Iridium, you go anywhere, 
pay a few hundred bucks. It's the waitresses come out, they get you the drink, they get you the meal, they get you the check. Next set, get them out. It's not a re. It, it, there's not the, the the collective consciousness is lacking, and I just want you to talk about what you, your your interpretation of the jazz life at the time that you hit. Okay, well, it was it was a life that mostly didn't involve uh, a wife and children. So I, uh, my first wife was a saint. My second wife was a saint in terms of letting me go off for the $5. Now, you know, it's a lot later, and now the gigs pay $50 if they pay it all. Right. It could be that much, and it could cost you half that just to get there. Um, so I think it was, it kept me from becoming a junkie because there were junkies around me everywhere. Everywhere. Me. Everywhere. And, uh, and I'm like, no, dude, I got to go. I got to get up. And, uh, you know. And you did have kids already. I mean, you did have yeah. a family. At yeah, that I point. got married when I was 20. When I moved to New York, I had one son and another one on the way. And so I, there was no. So the jazz life. New York in the, in, from 59, when I moved, or excuse me, 69, when I moved there. Uh, 67 was when I moved there. And it was, it was pretty bleak, but it was still possible to rent something. Now it's impossible to go to Manhattan. You have to go way out. And I mean, I don't, I don't know how people do it now. I have no idea. When people appear able to play and with a good feeling, I attribute it to being able to, you can, there were things that I could do once I saw Gary Peacock play. It, it, I realized that what I had to do, how much practicing I had to do to even begin to get over the instrument. Uh, and it was a huge challenge to me, but things didn't cost very much money. Even when Oregon was doing well, the loft I had in New York cost $425 a month. It was sixteen hundred feet, square foot. Yeah, it was. It was enormous. Brecker was the same way. You get a hundred. Yeah, it was. It was. It was manageable based yeah. on what you were getting paid. For but there was no once. By the time Oregon got going, there, there wasn't any work. I got to play in New York. I would do gigs with Paul Blay. I would do gigs with all kinds of people, but the gigs never paid anything. You know, it, it was just you get together, you rehearse some music, and then you get to play it, and that's it. And if you were lucky and if you were a good enough player, you might get asked to go to Europe with some band. Now, Friesen cultivated that, for instance. He worked as sidemen with just tons and tons Mal of Mal Waldron, Stan Getz, yeah. and on and on and on. He worked with all these people. And I never, because I discovered so early on uh, the, the connection with the Winter Consort, getting to make a record with them, then getting to make a record with Oregon. And so I would turn down uh, anything if it interfered with Oregon. And I would say that that worked for, you know, for the first 10 years, that worked great. And after that, uh, after Colin died, um, I still kept playing with Oregon. And, and in retrospect, it, it could not, I love Ralph's music, and I love those guys, but I really couldn't, uh, I, I passed on a lot of situations that I could not stay with. Getting to work with Rabia, do five projects with him, getting to work with Nancy King and do those four, four projects, um, getting to work with Karish and do those four different records. Um, Getting to work with Jerry Grinelli duo, one of my great regrets is I think you played on the radio something from that. Hold on, wait, 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 hold on. This is my Grinelli's tuning in right now. What do you? When did you and Grinelli play duo? Uh, in Seattle, we did a record called Forces of Flight. I love this. This is uh, this is just unbelievable. And Grinelli is astonishing and just a miraculous player on keyboards on anything. He can play anything. He's he's a just a marvelous marvelous guy. But going 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 back to what what it, what was interesting whether you or not were you aware of the fact that the people that 
created this music were treated so poorly in this country? And how yeah, did, and I how was did, aware, how, and it had a lot to do with race and... Same stuff that we're dealing with today. Yeah. Yeah, there's, nothing has changed, really. The money, uh, the money isn't there. Now it has to do with the Internet and, and uh, the publishing money going away. Um, but it, it's always been a... Uh, I think it's always been a, a suffering life. And when I was young, it looked like it was possible. I could make that $125 that was my first rent. Barely, and I finally lost that place, but if there was a way to sort of, you know, creep around <laughs> underneath, behind, around. Right. And to get to play with Paul Blay, to get to, I mean, the, the lessons that were in that, I got to spend the better part of the first year I was in New York going to Blay's house. Uh, every Saturday and sitting with he and Annette Peacock and rehearsing music. They were just starting to use the Moog synthesizer. And so we rehearsed all this music, mostly music that Paul just plays the music that his women write for him for those first two partners he had for Carla and Annette. And that music was so amazing and it was a great lesson to learn. And Blay and Peacock were the, were the biggest fans of Oregon in our first years, they would come to as many concerts as they could. They would critique everything. They loved it, but they always had, you know, constructive things to say. What would they? What was the something they would say? This is fascinating. You're getting critique from masters. Well, just you know what they liked about yeah. it and what what really worked and how how unique it really was. They were, but in those initial rehearsals with them, you know, Paul would say, "Glenn, you know, why did you repeat that note?" You know, <laughs> You don't have to repeat it just once. Just leave it there. So Paul would be, Paul was super, uh, super forgiving and super, you know, really marvelous. Um, David Holland moved there the same time I was there. So here was David. John was there. McLaughlin. Jan Hummer was there. I got to play. John McLaughlin, you say? Yeah. Yeah. I got to play with the best people. So... They'd all be at Blaze apartment on Saturdays. No, no. Or just collectively, you guys all came at the same time, so you'd want. Yeah, up we were all yeah. there yeah. together. So there were different things going on, and it looked like this was not going to be the jazz life. Essentially, all the people in Weather Report, Return to Forever, Mahavishnu, mostly those were guys who came to New York to play with Miles, and they were the quality to do that. Keith Jarrett was there. He was playing with Miles. Even when he didn't want to play with Miles. Miles would get him to go ahead. So, <laughs> so. Use his Zen mask. I think I considered, I put myself in that maybe it's too much ego in this because I definitely was pretty picky. But I felt like I went there as well to, to I was emulating Ron Carter at the time. I was able to uh, hang out with David and go to, Miles' gigs and get to go and meet Miles. So I felt like I was, you know, sort of led into the inner sanctum of, of uh, some great, great music, playing with some wonderful people. It was, in, in, it I was got almost. To hear, hear Paul Chambers just <clears throat> at the end of his life. I went to see him in a gig. There was like nobody there, but he's playing with a guitarist and he, he was playing and he had steel strings. And everybody who's played got strings in the last, since Winton came on the scene and said, no, you have to go back, way back. Uh, and Paul was like, oh, I love these strings. I said, Paul, you sound so amazing with a bow. <laughs> he said, yeah, it's a steel strings. I just love it. I don't know why I didn't find him earlier. And uh, so I got to go and hang out and say hello. I got to tell Ron Carter about Stanley Clark. Oh, yeah. He said, I'll have to go see how he handles the problem. <laughs> yeah, I think, by all accounts, Ron Carter despised the electric bass. But yeah. no, Stanley could play great upright as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, can you, uh, as we wrap up, play a tune on the piano as we leave? Uh, or you could play on the ba play a bass, whatever you want. Well, what would I like to do? I haven't been playing the piano because we're... I just... Uh, right now... 
my relationship with the piano is that I've never owned until now a piano with three pedals that worked. Hmm. such a great honor to connect with you again, my brother. Thank you so much, Thanks. man. Thanks for coming and hanging, and I really appreciate it. We'll see you all in a little bit.